Live streaming is on. Thank you, sir. Please take over. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are the, in the third uh, webinar uh, series to celebrate Dr. Ramachandra Bhatt centenary. We have a very interesting uh, topic, which is a challenging one in the current uh, situation with the various uh, research programs happening all over the world. In today's uh, webinar, we have uh, very distinguished speakers, very senior speakers, and representing various uh, statutory bodies, and also giving us insight into the ethics in research and the training. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce our guru, Dr. D.K. Srinivas. He's a guru for all the gurus, teacher for the teachers, who has done his MBBS and MD in community medicine, and uh, later underwent uh, WHO fellowship at Regional Training Center in Sri Lanka and Thailand on uh, special training in medical education. His passion is in medical education. He has served... Yes, served and taught in prestigious Maulana Azad Medical College, Goa Medical no, College, no, and also Jipmar no, Pondicherry as the dean. When he was in the no, 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 Jipmar Jip Pondicherry, he developed his faculty development, and he was one of the founder members of the first National Teachers Training Center at Pondicherry, established by. Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India in 1976, almost nearly about 44 years back. And he has contributed to training of teachers in educational science and technology. Right. And also, I'm very happy to say that he has the distinction of conducting one of the highest number of teachers training center programs in India. He was identified as by Dr. S. Kanta, the first vice chancellor, and invited him to join the Rajiv Gandhi University way back in 1996. He brought about a sea of changes in the curriculum in all the faculties of health sciences, medical, dental, nursing. And today, whatever that we are following in the curriculum, the training, we should go to Dr. D. K. Srinivas, who picked up the people to prepare the curriculum and it is one of the best curriculum in the health sciences, not only in the country, but also the abroad. The, he has served also as a consultant in WHO in Indonesia, World Bank Training Consultant Project, NAC Accreditation, and he has Nearly 97 papers in peer-reviewed index and national and international scientific journals. One of the important books that he has authored, along with Dr. Shaker, is What is Not Taught in Medical Colleges. Because we have a structured curriculum, but many things are not taught in the medical colleges. And he has highlighted all those things, which is worth to be read by a very healthcare professional. And he has presented various keynote addresses and guest lectures on various topics related to health professional education, served as the member in the various universities in Karnataka. And it is uh, my pleasure to work with him from last uh, 24 years uh, very closely in uh, Rajiv Gandhi University. I should say that he is one of the greatest uh, person in our education field. Many are referred to him as Bhishma Pitavaha, but I would like to call him as Dronacharya because he has trained many of us and who are in turn are able to pass on whatever we are learned from him. And it is our great pleasure, mm -hmm. sir, on behalf of Dr. S. Ramachandra Birth Centenary Celebration Committee, we welcome you and it is our honor to have you in the midst of us and you are very familiar 
to all of us. Welcome you, sir, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, sir. Over to Dr. D. K. Shinvas. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Yeah. Morning. Am I audible? Yes. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nagesh. You've been, you've been, uh, I almost feel flattered oh. as much as humbled. Thank you for saying so many good words. I hope I deserve that. I welcome all the panelists. I also welcome the entire team which has been conducting this program. Program. Uh, am I again yeah. audible? Let me check test. Am I audible? Yeah, good. Uh, now, this is a very unique event. I am very emotional. I am emotional because never in my life have I come across where alumni is celebrating their teacher in so many ways and for so many days. I must congratulate all those who conceived this and all those who have made this happen, particularly the Dr. Nagesh, Dr. Faizuddin, Dr. Manjunath Puranik, who has been working so hard and all others. I am also emotional because the I have seen Dr. Ramchandra when I was doing my internship. He was a very pleasant man, smiling, soft spoken, soft speaking, and one can easily say he was a real gentleman. I'm also emotional because I've seen the dental college coming up. First, it was in a OPD building of the Victoria Hospital. Later on, it has its it had its own building, and I was fortunate enough to participate in the sixtieth year celebration of Government Dental College. I said I'm emotional because. I've been closely associated with the Victoria Hospital campus and therefore with GDC too. It is because my grandfather, Major Dr. S. Narayan Rao, was in the Mysore Lancers who served in the First World War. When he returned, he was made the resident medical officer, RMO, of the Victoria Hospital. And he stayed in the quarters in the campus of the Victoria Hospital where some of you might remember Dr. Ratna Bai More, yeah. the professor of obstetrics used to say when she was RMO of Vadim Hospital. It was in that building my the Nishitartha of my parents were conducted. I was born in Vadim Hospital. The midwife who conducted my delivery was Taubani, who became the matron of Victoria Hospital when I was doing my house job. This is my attachment to the Victoria Hospital campus and therefore GDC too. In 1950, Victoria Hospital was opened up in 1900. In 1950, when they celebrated the Golden Jubilee celebration, the Mysore Maharaja was there and I participated in the function. I also participated in the function 
that was to celebrate the centenary of the Victoria Hospital and the opening of centenary building. So one could say Victoria Hospital is is in my blood. But from my conception and and even today. I'm also emotional because perhaps this will be one of the last such great events that I might be participating because I don't know when I'll be called upon. Now let me, in saying these few words, let me now welcome all of you to this unique event. We have fixed up We have four speakers today. The opening speaker is Dr. Valinda Timms, followed by me, and then Dr. Rajkumar Alay will speak, and then finally a recording of Dr. Janakra Sabarwal will be. I will now introduce you briefly Dr. Valinda Timms. And she will also, when she starts talking, she will also tell the, the title of her talk. About three and a half or four years ago, somebody, is, somebody has to mute their uh, audio, I think. We are hearing some background noise. Um, it was about four years ago or four and a half years ago, around four o'clock in the afternoon, <clears throat> A smart, well-dressed lady walked into my house, a very charming one for that. And that was none else than Dr. Valinda Tims. She she was she wanted to know whether she could publish a book that she was preparing. And uh, she, she, she was ethics all over, maybe because she passed out from Christian Medical College Velo. She did her MBBS there. Thereafter, she did anesthesia. She practiced anesthesiology in private admission hospitals. And uh, she has done two postgraduate courses, diploma in ethics, one at National Law University and the other at the ICMR. She has also done a fellowship program at Seattle and uh, on uh, research ethics. She is the working editor of Indian Journal of Medical Ethics. She is also an author of Biomedical Ethics published by Elsevier. In fact, it was published in 2000, um, I'm sorry, 19, in 2016, and although now there is a second edition of that. She has prepared two manuscripts, one on dental ethics with Dr. Vaibhavi, another on uh, pharmacy ethics with Dr. Shobha Rani Hiremat. These two will be published uh, soon by Rajiv Gandhi Health Science University. She is a member of the UNESCO International Forum of Teachers. She chairs UNESCO chair at St. John's Research Institute. She also chairs many ethics committee and she's also a member of several ethics committees. At the moment, she is adjunct associate professor of the Division of Health and Humanities at St. John's Research Institute. Over to you, Dr. Linda. It's a pleasure to, to be associated with you and to hear you now. Dr. Valinda, please. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas, for that lovely introduction. Good morning, everyone. You are a... <laughs> Good morning, everybody. You are a lovely lady, um, so I have to introduce. It is a pleasure to be here. I want to, first of all, uh, congratulate the organizing committee for um, this in, in, uh, including this segment on ethics in your seminar. I think this is a very unusual and a very, very promising step uh, going forward 
uh, in in seminars, you know, in health. Uh, it says a lot for the members of the organizing committee, and it also um, speaks of uh, the the personality of uh, the person we are honoring today, and whose honor we are having this uh, seminar. So my topic today is ethics in healthcare, and I will I plan to <clears throat> uh, discuss um, not only the importance of healthcare uh, of ethics in healthcare, but also the need for ethics in training. Uh, as we have so many senior people here and uh, and faculty as well who have tuned in and the importance of uh, bringing ethics back into um, dental and medical training. Uh, though I will be speaking from my experience in medical ethics and I will be talking about uh, medical ethics in general, it is intended that this will also apply to dental practice, dental professionals, and dental training as well. There seems to be uh, some issue with uh, sharing of the slides from my side. So I have asked uh, Dr. Uh, Shriyansh to please help with that. And so he will be sharing uh, my slides from his side. Can we have it full screen? Yeah, thank you, Shriyans. And uh, I will uh, request you to please move the slides according to uh, when I give the call. Thank you very much. So ethics has, we have a long heritage in ethics in this country and also across the world. As healthcare professionals, we know right from the start of um, medical practice as a profession, there has been an emphasis on training of the individual to uh, imbibe attributes and attitudes uh, of professionalism and also of character that will suit the, the uh, his profession and will suit uh, the, the kind of work that he is going to do. And some of our early uh, teachers as well. Um, we have uh, Charaka and Sushuta from, from uh, our own now. Uh, uh, we have Jaraka and Shushruta from our own heritage, but we also have Hippocrates from other heritage and, and that way across the world. There has always been in the teaching of um, science and the art of, uh, of medicine, there's always been emphasis on uh, ethics. Jaraka spoke of treating, uh, working uh, for the relief of patients with all your heart and soul. He talked about the character and he emphasized the character of the of the doctor and a person who treats patients only on humanitarian grounds without seeking any personal benefit. Similarly, uh, we also have uh, Shushruta, who was an early surgeon from our times, and he too spoke particularly about the poor and the lonely, the destitute, and how we should use our science in service. And in the same way, Hippocrates too, across the world, also talked about what lies at the heart, what are the principles at the heart of uh, ethical practice, saying that wherever the art of medicine is loved, there also is a love of humanity. And when a doctor cannot do good, he must keep from doing harm. So this is uh, where we have begun. And even with uh, in later years, we have um, giants of medical practice like William Ostler and others of the 20th century and the 19th century who emphasized the art of medicine. They talked about the healing art. They, they spoke of more than the craft of medicine, uh, underscoring that medicine, the practice of healing is a moral enterprise that calls for us to look at the needs of society look at us as serving others and to look at us as persons who have to embody a principled attitude to life and to others. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, but, so what happened in, if we have all of these features and that is how it was in, uh, right at the start and then uh, very slowly, insidiously, uh, there began to be some changes in the formation uh, of uh, uh, of our students, 
uh, it went from a personal one-on-one -on -one training that we saw uh, with earlier teachers uh, and earlier practice of medicine where uh, students uh, were selected and students were personally taught to now what we have as medical colleges. And we have large numbers of students taught by uh, taught through a curriculum. So there were some kind of changes in the way that uh, students were formed. Then um, in addition to that, it was there were changes in how you chose the vocation, how it was selected. Initially, people felt the calling. They had examples of people in their family or, or they saw good works and they decided to do the same thing. But now it is all about entrance exams and competitive entrance exams that you know people have to continue to through their um, tra uh, through their years of study and then they just go into the next step of writing competitive exams mm -hmm. and so it moves from a call to serve there is now uh, a kind of a social aspiration in choosing uh, medicine or dentistry as a, a profession these are some of the changes that have happened and caused this once noble profession to, to now be viewed as a kind of a lucrative occupation rather than a profession. Something in which I will yes, gain, uh, uh, fame and gain okay. probably wealth as well. And so with all these kind of, um, uh, mm -hmm. all, we, all of this kind of change, in this, in this game, was, did not find a place in the curriculum. It was, Sometimes it was seen, you know, as a small sub mention in forensic medicine or maybe in community health. There was some kind of a mention uh, of uh, laws related to ethics and, uh, and you know, ethical responsibilities, but it was not taken as a separate issue. It was not integrated into the training of medicines. So what happened was that in the la in the last century, for the most part, students have had to depend on role models. That, uh, that, that are there among the faculty. So they have, may have positive role models, in which case they pick up some things that are good, or they have negative role models, which also shows them what they should not be, they don't want to be, both of them being important things. But there's a greater dependence on that kind of role modeling rather than teaching of ethics. And some of the students who are in mission hospitals who are working in charitable hospitals, uh, and they see the objective of serving social needs they they buy from that the importance of being in tune with what are the needs of the people and the country and and they have a heart for serving the poor so they develop or they they understand their profession through the context in which they are serving um so the language of ethics is kind of missing in this whole thing because we don't spend time talking about ethics, principles of ethics, what is the right thing to do, what we should not do, what are our expectations, what are social expectations, what are our duties. We do not have this uh, lexicon and language in our training and in our medical colleges, dental colleges. And so there's, there is a, there's a change which is very subtle that people stop thinking about those things. When you don't have the language and we don't have the conversation, then people stop thinking about this as important. And that leads to a different kind of a professional. We, we, we begin to see that what we have then are more unethical practices, insensitive professionals, and the kind of behavior that we do not want to see in our doctors. And this is the result of these not so subtle changes <laughs> happening uh, across. Them. Some of the other changes that have happened that have led to this uh, are extrinsic uh, in the training and in the individuals themselves. Extrinsic cha uh, change. Is there some background sound? Can we ask them to mute, please? So, some of these intrinsic changes are well recognized by all of us. There has been a subtle but continuous privatization of uh, medical yeah, colleges yeah. And, yeah. Training, and also uh, hospitals. Dr. Manjuna, can you please ask the person to mute? Thank you. Yeah. 
so this privatization when we when when at the minute the um, healthcare and training becomes a private enterprise the cost of training goes up it puts pressure on students uh, to to recover the cost of training and it also then uh, it marginalizes students uh, who are meritorious and who may not be able to afford that kind of training but they may deserve it but they may not be able to afford it and the same thing happens in healthcare the minute there is privatization then it excludes people and only those who can afford can uh, can receive the kind of care that they require so medicalization of healthcare is the another issue which has happened where the emphasis has shifted from preventive and community medicine into hospitals and and uh, uh, treatments so the focus then becomes on diagnostics on uh, you know on lab reports your people are being treated on the basis of their lab reports they are not being tra treated holistically medicines vaccines are and uh, certain things like um uh, uh hospital care have become uh, emphasized over other things like um general uh, preventive health lifestyle and healthy lifestyles and so on so the cost again this drives up the cost of care and it changes the perspectives of people who approach doctors for medicine <clears throat> the corporatization of the health industry has also uh, been you know inevitable but it brought with it a lot of problems when when the health uh, services is looked on as a means of making profit of generating profit and at the same time also uh, we, uh, with corporatization came insurance and health insurance and this again drives up the cost of health care realigns the focus of uh, doctors and uh, health institutions and marginalizes and excludes people from health services <clears throat> so this at the same time while this was going on the privatization and the corporatization we saw on uh, sadly we saw the decline of the public health service of the public sector the number of uh, public uh, uh, hospitals was declining or remaining the same uh, and uh, the quality on the infrastructure quality of care infrastructure in public institutions uh, was not of the best standard and so again it led to a sort of um, inequality where uh, people who would go to public health services uh, found that they were not getting what they uh, deserved and they began to take loans to go and access uh, health care in the private sector so this drove this these changes drove up the cost of care and when the cost of care is higher then the people patients have higher expectations and when their expectations are not met they are dissatisfied and there is a distrust uh, generated so the doctor patient relationship is completely uh, you know, Uh, pulled apart and uh, patients see themselves on the other side not working together with the doctor but on the opposing side of the doctor and through this entire time uh, of the last century there was a, a greater emphasis on human rights and people began to understand uh, that they had a voice they could express what they required they would they did not have to uh, always be treated paternalistically by doctors but they could they had choices and doctors had to respect their choices Uh, in health as well this was another aspect that came in at the same time which meant that doctors began to be questioned and when there was a lack of trust and there was a, and there was an opacity and lack of transparency in what was happening in hospitals it led to more and more cases of um, uh, uh, medical negligence going to the courts so there is there has always been medical errors and there has been negligence but uh, the number of cases going to the courts indicates the lack of trust that people have in uh, in uh, the medical system and in doctors another thing which happened was also the introduction of new technologies uh, into the whole medical space where it was earlier not so high tech uh, and uh, medicine was practiced low tech and then slowly technology entered it much of technology is wonderful and has done great things for health and dental services but there are some technologies like stem cell uh, technologies nanotechnologies robotics assisted reproductive techniques organ transplants and others which are which are fraught with um 
medical dilemmas. There are moral dilemmas in the use of these uh, technologies only because long-term usage, understanding of long-term usage is not very clear and there is no clear understanding of what could be the harm. And also these kind of, many of these kind of technologies tend to be expensive and so they exclude people. They keep, they, they keep large sections of the population away from accessing them because of the high cost. And for all these reasons, they, these bioethical dilemmas in using these technologies uh, again creates a kind of a churning where patients feel that doctors are using technology to raise the cost of care and to exclude them. <clears throat> then uh, also this, this kind of experience in society where there is this, you know, social inequalities because there are some who cannot access, who cannot, and the injustices of the public health system where what can be accessed is not of the quality that is expected. <clears throat> so this leads to some kind of extremes in healthcare. Uh, uh, when, if you just look at our country alone, we have world-class tertiary care in the urban hospitals, super specialities. Mm. And on the other hand side, we have we see very poorly equipped primary health centers and lack of infrastructure. On one end, we have cutting edge research in stem cell, genetic medicine. And on the other side, we have still not overcome uh, the, the problem of childhood diarrhea, infectious diseases, even leprosy and tuberculosis is still prevalent uh, in this country. <clears throat> Indian doctors are among the best in the world and they are coveted by all, all countries all over. And yet there is a huge gap in demand for health professionals, especially in the rural areas and in the distal areas. India is the largest provider of generic drugs globally, but we have the largest, highest payout for medicines among patients, among all the countries in the world. So we still pay for medicines and we don't get medicines uh, at a, at a, you know, to our satisfaction, especially the people who cannot afford their access to medicine is pitiful. And we have seen this in uh, worsen during the time of the pandemic. <clears throat> So this call, this this is where there is a call for ethics training, and and this happened across the world. I must say that it was not that uh, it, this was happening in India alone. This was seen across the world as this whole um, the medicalization, privatization of health, uh, and also social determinants of health across countries. These were under great stress, and uh, this declining standards in ethics and the falling quality, the dropping in the quality of care was observed across the world. And in 1999, the World Medical Association passed a resolution on the inclusion of medical ethics and human rights in the curriculum of medical schools worldwide. Every country was expected to take steps to include um, ethics into uh, the curriculum in all of the health verticals. The other thing that happened in 2005 was UNESCO uh, UNESCO came up with the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights. The UNESCO Chair in Bioethics uh, uh, started their movement across the world, introducing uh, units of the chair in all countries, medical colleges across every country, so that ethics, uh, bioethics training curriculum could be disseminated downstream into medical colleges and fill the gap in training uh, that was there. Um, now that there has been a call. Following the call in 1999 to introduce uh, medical ethics, the Indian, the Medical Council of India brought out, uh, gazetted the Indian Medical Council Professional Conduct Etiquette and Ethics Regulations 2002, in which they talked about the duties to the, duties to the patients, duties to uh, the other professionals, uh, duties to society. They listed the unethical acts and they also talked about the punishments uh, that would uh, for, for unethical and unprofessional behavior. But again, this was not disseminated in a systematic fashion. It was again left in the forensic curriculum. It was sometimes read, sometimes not read. Most medical graduates had not even heard of it. There was no way in which it was coming into the curriculum in a, um, in, in a proper way. Uh, and so most, uh, even the oath at the end of that uh, was not uh, disseminated, it was an oath at graduation. But again, this again was not uh, disseminated to medical students and, and, and graduates. 
And then uh, finally, after a lot of effort in 2019, uh, the Medical Council finally, the new National Medical Commission uh, introduced in 2019, the ATCOM modules into the curriculum. ATCOM standing for Attitude, Ethics and Communication. They felt that these were the key things missing in the current curriculum. And though we put out world-class medical graduates, we have uh, failed in this area where we develop attitude and we talk about principles of ethics and also communication skills, which have become very important. Uh, in, so this we, we look at this as a new uh, positive step, something that we can look forward to. So this urgent need now uh, to, to uh, follow through with the effort that is made by um, the National Medical Council um, in the backdrop of this kind of dissatisfaction, distrust that we are seeing in society, the violence against doctors uh, across the country and uh, has led us to reconsider what are we teaching our students? What are we, how are we training them? What kind of professionals do we really need? And how do we, how do we create that kind of a professional who is sensitive to uh, social needs, uh, social determinants of health, the human needs in health, um, the kind of the doctor who will advocate um, for patients and uh, speak up for human rights, uh, doctors who will look at health policy and critique them, doctors who will speak up when there is um, when when there's garbage collection, when there's a when there is pollution in the air, doctors who will think about these as very important for the as social determinants and speak up for patients so that preventive health gets an emphasis. Doctors who are leaders in situations of crisis, floods, and the pandemic, who can, who can lobby with the political powers and also with the administration to get what the patient requires, to get what the doctors need to be effective. Doctors who will speak up and lead society and finally fulfill the mandate in the National Health Policy 2017, where they talked about the creation of a competent, ethical, and responsive health professional. <clears throat> These kind of steps of integrating ethics into the curriculum can lead to this. So it is time, and this is an important time for all of us here, present here at the seminar, and uh, across the health verticals, to start thinking ethics, thinking about how we can talk ethics, thinking about how we can be role models, thinking of how we can introduce this into the curriculum, how we can generate an, a, a body of opinion about ethics, how we can teach ethics. Those who are teaching at, 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 uh, in the classroom, those who are teaching at the bedside, um, you know, all through the teaching um, uh, curriculum, we can introduce uh, ethics and integrate ethics into the curriculum. This is now the, the new move of integrating ethics right from year one, uh, from starting with the selection of candidates um, and their motive, their motivation for joining the profession, then integrating ethics into every, every year of the profession, um, uh, of professional training. And then following that, uh, teaching ethics in a way that makes us, uh, completes our uh, mandate as uh, faculty and uh, uh, health, health teachers. We are teaching about medicine, we are teaching about health, and this is a part of the training that we cannot ignore. In the words of uh, Albert Einstein, certainly and one must take what nature gives us as one finds it. But there is also such a thing as a spirit of the times, an attitude of mind characteristic of a particular generation, which is passed on from individual to individual and gives it its distinctive mark to society. Each of us has to do his little bit towards transforming this spirit of the times. With that, I will close my uh, talk and I'm, I'm open to questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Olinda, for your presentation. Uh, may I suggest that uh, we keep all the question and answer at the end? 
uh, and uh, I think Dr. Manjunath is noting down if there are any questions, he will note down and pass it on. Is it okay with? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, thank you. With you, Dr. Valinda? Yes, sir. May I? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Now, may I start my presentation now? Uh, I would like to show slides and I'll give me to a minute. I'll get on to the slideshow. <clears throat> Are you able to see my slides? Are you able to see my slides? No. Hello? Not able to see. Not able to see. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll come back. Where am I? I'm missing. Uh, yes. So you have to click the share the entire screen and then wait for the preview. No, sir. Okay. Okay. Share your screen, then the entire screen and wait for no. the preview. Uh, wait. One second. Yes. Uh, Um, it's not taking up. Share the screen. Um, don't sh share your screen, then the entire screen. What? Share your screen, then the entire screen. Yeah, and I tried. I have been trying. You wait yeah, for I've been trying. preview. Yeah, now. Yes. I'll wait. Yeah, I'll wait. Then click the share button once the preview is ready. Uh, yes, I think so. No. Did the preview come, sir? No. Just send me the PPT, sir. I'll share the screen then. Can you email me the PPT? Sir?
ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ನಾನು ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಉಪ್ಪಿಟ್ಟು ಮಾಡ್ಸಿದ್ ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಆಗುತ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಚಪಾತಿ Yes, so just share your screen, entire screen. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for that icon, share screen. I'm not getting that icon. You just need to... Oh, take... Yes, now I got it. Yeah. Yes. Is it visible? Yes, sir, it is visible. Yes, sir, it is. Please don't click there. Yeah, just open your PPT now. Uh, PPT is visible? Uh, yes, sir, your screen is visible. You just need to open your presentation. Yeah, I, I'll open. Yes, okay. Is it okay? Yes, sir, it is. Yeah, just go into the full screen. Enlarge it. Yes, yes. yes. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Okay, right. Well, let me start. 
Um, sorry for the glitch. <coughs> Uh, sorry for the glitch. May I start my program with uh, Guru Vandana? In fact, the entire program is actually a Guru Vandana because we are celebrating and paying our respects to Mahan Guru, Dr. Ramachandra. Uh, this is usually when we used to have face-to-face -face meeting, there would be a coffee break. And in this, there is no coffee break. Therefore, I am offering you virtually a cup of coffee uh, so that you could have a hot cup of coffee and listen to my presentation. And the presentation is about the role of university in biotics, education and practice. Uh, university has, according to me, three roles to play. First is uh, to prepare a blueprint or a roadmap. And then it offers a signpost or that means provides direction and later on assesses to what extent, what extent the program it has planned in the search and is being implemented. When you look at the signpost, I remember of an incident that happened. There was an young person who was uh, a little bit confused. And on the, the other side, there was an elderly gentleman standing and this uh, Youngster went to him and asked, Sir, where does this road go? And the wise old man said, My dear young man, this road does not go anywhere. Please tell me where do you want to go and I will direct you. So the signposts are just clear directions. It is for us to walk the talk. Now, my plan of presentation today consists of these three. Is there a need? Why? Is there a need for The universities to to teach biotics is there a need for biotics education practice academically in fact dr olinda has laid already the foundation for that and expressed the need and then if there is that need how and in what way the university can uh, implement this and then then i will also look what has been the challenges for the universities to introduce ethics and lastly, my own dream. The need for biotics education and practice universities, I'm talking of Rajiv Gandhi University. I'm, take, I'm taking that as a case study, as an example, uh, because of various reasons. Look at this vision statement of Rajiv Gandhi University. I'm fascinated by that. The first it says the people should live a full span of life allotted by God in perfect health and it is from Veda and if you if you also see Isha Vesunukya it says that this hundred years of life we have should be used for doing work karma with dharma and then the university should strive for academic excellence by education and training of health professionals and look at the third point that universities enable to carry out the professional duties ethically and another word beautifully equitably so this is how there is a mandate and there was a mandate at the rajiv university that education uh, of ethics must be done and it should promote also scientific temper in health science research because research always goes with ethics and also we should be socially accountable, which Dr. Valinda uh, stressed very well. I would now to bring you, bring to your attention, what was the situation in the beginning years of the Rajivan University? The registration of dissertation topic, which was essential, which was mandatory by the council recommendation, only a sheet of paper used to be sent to the universities the then universities. It only consisted of the title of the dissertation topic they intend to work upon and the uh, guide's name. That is all that the university received. The guides were not as per the council guidelines. Let me give you two examples of that. In one particular medical college, in the Department of Surgery, there were 11 postgraduate students uh, admissions. 
and nine of these students were under one guy. Only two he left to others. In another situation, the another professor of obstetrics in one of the college had five students under her, under her, mark my word, under her. And this lady once walked into my room in the university. She was very assertive, angry. She said, look, what is this? When I have been teaching for, for so many years, now the university says I can't have five medical students. as I can't guide five students. So then in another situation, a dental college in one building, two colleges were being run. Uh, they, the, although there were two principals, they were sharing the guides. So this was, uh, uh, these were some of the situations that they were in. The citation of references was haphazard. And then the, in most colleges, there were no institutional ethics committee. At that time, there were 168 colleges. Not more than 10 or 15 colleges had the, these ethics committees. And of course, animals were used for research and even in exams. This was the situation at that. Now I'll give you a few examples of dissertation topics which were received university and also some of the research proposals. Um, look, this is a, a research topic received in the time from uh, pharmacy, faculty of pharmacy, pharmacodynamic interaction and uh, ethical clearance. They say there's no need because this drug is widely and commonly used. If a drug is being widely and commonly used, where is the need to sacrifice so many animals? Is this study necessary? Based on the principle of essentiality, the ethics committee cannot pass this. Another example. Uh, oh, look, look at this. There were two proposals, dissertation proposals. One to study gynecological problems among adults and girls, a good topic, but another one, a clinical and epidemiological study of HIV infected, HIV infected and HIV exposed children. I don't know how the ch poor children got HIV infected and how would you know that they're exposed to children? And where was the study site? In an urban government school. And look at the method view. They would even perform permanent examination. Can it be done in a school? And how do how do you know that children are exposed to HIV or they are infected? Now, this when I read this topic, in fact, my heart stopped for a couple of minutes, I should say. Luckily, I'm still alive. Ethical clearance column, not applicable. And so many ethical issues arise. How can you pass such a research project? Another one, the objective is to assess antibacterial activity. This is from dental faculty and the PG student uses a, 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 a product provided by a pharmaceutical company using the trademark. This is a neem product. And then, then the question arose, ethical clearance, it's blank. That column is blank. Now the student, neither the guide nor the student is aware of the principles of a conflict of interest. Another one. This is a ultrasonographic study in a gestational age. The objective is to correlate presence of distal femoral epiphysis with fetal sex. And you know very well in India, the determination of uh, fetal sex is uh, prohibited. Ethical issues of confidential legal arises, yet this was submitted without uh, bothering about that. Another one, dermatoglyphic study, a comparative study between science of clinics and controls. The method will be even examination of patients and controls. Ethical aliens are not known the blank. And the study is being done by a postgraduate student of the Department of Anatomy. There are no co-guides. Co so the question of principles of professional competence in performing this 
arises. Although the study is very interesting, dermatoglyphics. Angai Nodi, Aumanai Tunta. They want to do astrological uh, study. Now, these are some of the examples. I would like you to answer this question. Is there need for a university to improve the situation? Is there for need for university to, to train students in bioeducation for the research, etc.? If so, how can university, what role can university play? And what did Rajiv Gandhi used to do? They took certain policy decisions and also the enabling steps. Let me share the policy decisions that were taken. First, ethics teaching must be introduced in all courses. Dr. Olinda also mentioned about this, the need for this. And then a synopsis review should be done. So therefore, a system was developed for review of uh, synopsis before registration and the idea was this would improve the student's capability of performing research and then uh, recognition of guides as per the guidelines laid down by the various uh, councils and certain policy decisions were also taken the other was that institutional ethics committee should be mandatory in all the colleges. Ensure that guidelines of the councils are followed. You can't have two colleges in one building and two principals and common teachers. In another situation, there was one principal managing three different uh, colleges. And uh, also to encourage research, as you know, Howard, Hopkins were all is all famous because they are the, the amount of research they do. They, the quality of research too. So therefore, a department of research and development was also uh, opened up. <clears throat> then guidelines were given how to write a dissertation. These are some of the policy decisions that were taken. I will move on to what, how enabling, how did Rajiv Gandhi University help people to implement these? One is uh, orientation of medical college principles. The focus at that time was for medical colleges. And then because the 1997 regulation introduced ethics as a part of teaching, then a consultative workshop on bioethics was uh, conducted at the, at the university. Uh, many of you must have heard this uh, well-known name, Dr. Madhu Menon. He was the founder principal of the National Law University at Bangalore. Uh, an erudite scholar, he in fact gave a key, a keynote address and we had invited at that time from all faculties, Irish, others, etc. Then based on the reports and recommendations of this workshop, uh, an inclusive ethics curriculum was prepared by university. When I say inclusive, that means as uh, Dr. Olinda had I just mentioned it was delegated to forensic medicine in some places community medicine was supposed to teach no ethics should be taught by every department by every person therefore this curriculum was inclusive in the sense that every department will teach just for about two or three hours on various aspects of ethics for example in MBBS 40 hours was allotted for the entire course and uh, for all the pre, para and others, they would have six hours, eight hours of teaching like that. And an assessment uh, format was also given. Similarly, others faculties are also were expected to follow. What else? The enabling included Samparka. Samparka is that synopsis submitted by the students were reviewed by a subject committee and then if there are any observations, these synopsis were sent to each and every student by the university. That was how a close association was kept with. And uh, in 1999, 88, when this first synopsis review program started, we had to return 93% of all the protocols received. Essentially, as you would see, there was either ethical committee had not uh, given any comments, ethical, the column, the, the, the protocol consisted of uh, 
um, areas where there will be introduction, there will be objectives, material methods, and then uh, ethical clearance by the institution, then the remarks by guide and so on. And uh, in quite a good number, the ethical clearance was, uh, that column was blank, yeah, I've shown you that. Or there were many, many shortcomings in the objectives or material methods, etc. So it was sent back to the candidate to work upon that and then return. They were not rejected, they were sent back. And then similarly, I have given you the percentage of the ones which were returned, which had defective, some defective aspect in their protocol. There were also the students were encouraged to come and consult the curriculum development department in the university uh, to clarify any doubts, etc. And uh, in the course of what uh, six or seven years, some 3,900 students came and met us in the university. So also the guides. Uh, uh, so this is how we kept in contact with and helped the uh, both students and the guides to improve upon the research methods and dissertations. Uh, another enabling was handholding and training. A number of workshops were conducted, how to constitute institutional ethics committees, uh, what should be the guidelines, then uh, restriction of animal use because there, were, there was act and then there was law against use and then uh, research methodology workshops and so on. Also, there were a number of presentations were made in uh, colleges by going there and making presentations. Dr. Manjanath was telling that even in GDC, I had made one presentation in Synopsis. In fact, uh, many professional associations went there and presented. These were some of the uh, steps that the university had taken to improve bioethics education and practices. Now, let us assess what happened. What is the way forward? This is, I'm telling the old story. Now, we need to monitor what is the status of ethics curriculum. Are they being taught in the colleges? What are the methods are being? Are we raising questions in our uh, question papers or in, in, in BIOC? Is any assessment is being made of the learning of ethics by the students. Has the quality of synopsis improved? Has the quality of dissertation improved? Are the institutional ethics committee functioning? Are they effective? And now with online, see they now the synopsis review is online. And with this online, I am afraid whether there, there is any samparka, with the postgraduate students and guides, these were some of the uh, doubts that arose me. These were the aspects that we need to uh, look at the progress. Now, what are the challenges the university faces for bioethics educational practice? First question is my, what makes a university? Everybody says university should do, oh, university is not doing. The university is only a building. If you see Madras University or Bombay University, they have nice Gothic buildings, huge buildings. Rajiv Gandhi University has no building at all. In fact, they are sharing the Jayanagar General Hospital. Is that the building consists of university or the people who work there, people who are associated? And one of the most important people who are associated with the university are teachers. And what is the commitment of the people associated with the university? the boards of studies, the academic councils, and so on. Unfortunately, there is also lack of role models, both at the international level. Look at this pandemic. Pandemic, how China is behaving. Look at the US. Look at the president of uh, the United States acting with reference to the elections. At the national level, our own leaders are not following the three codes of uh, conduct required for the pandemic, no masking, no maintaining the distance, 
and no sanitization. Even in academic, there is a lot of plagiarism. And then uh, the way we have behaved in the pandemic, Dr. Olinda just now mentioned, so I will not go further. And then the, the impact of social media on our own behavior and our own ethical practices. So what is the way for improvement? Let's learn from, I'll give you some examples here. I will take up a story from Ramayana. This is the fight between Dundubi, a Rakshasa, a demon, who assumed the shape of a wild buffalo and he calls Wali, uh, you know, the Wali, the, the king of uh, Kishkinda, to fight. Usually those days, in fact, people used to invite people for fight. And Dundabi invites Wali for a fight during night times because the Rakshasa are very strong during, during the night times. And then the, I quote the Samskrita from the Valmiki. He says, do not come and fight with me if you are Matta, Pramatta, Supta or Madana Mohita. That means if you are intoxicated, if you are not feeling well, if you are sleepy, that is Supta, if you are still lustful, Madana Mohana, still lustful, or if you are weak, or you are not mentally ready, or you are unable to hold arms, and so many conditions he lists down. And if any of these things, I will not fight with you because it is sinful to fight with such a person. It is equal to killing a fetus, Brunahatya, and it is unethical to fight. So this is the code of conduct even a Rakshasa had with reference to fighting with another person. Another story I would like to share with. This is a folk story. Many of us who are in Karnataka are very Familiar with this, Kunyakoti is the well known, the virtuous cow, and it one day it strays far in the jungle, and there an old hungry tiger is about to pounce upon it. The cow, the Kunyakoti, pleads, Please allow me to go home. One last time, let me feed my <clears throat> cough, and I'll hand over the, that cough to guardians. And I'll promise I'll come back to you after completing my duty. And I'll be your next pay. And then what happens? The, the Vagra, the tiger, allows Punya Koti to go. That means even the tiger had some faith. And when the Punya Koti returns, the tiger is so impressed at the honesty and the altruism, the devotion to duty, and feels refuses to eat because the tiger feels that it is unethical and in fact it it commits suicide. It jumps and then kills itself. This is the situation. This is when Rakshasas and animals have a code of ethical practices. We men, can't we follow? Dr. Valinda described several ways how there is deterioration of our own behavior. Now, in summary, that I have spoken about three roles the university can play, a roadmap, the signposts and milestones, the vision statement drives us to prepare education, education with reference to ethics and uh, ethical practice. Uh, you have seen the situation analysis. We have also seen the policy decisions that were taken, that ethics should be taught in all the course, in all the faculties, in, by all subjects, and mandatory institutional ethical committees. And now there is need for monitoring and face several challenges. Now, before I conclude, I have, I'm not so pessimistic, I'm optimistic, and I have a ray of hope. And I'd like to share an experience with the Avi Dental College. Um, Dr. Dinesh started this program of uh, ethics uh, workshops during their white coat ceremony. As a part of the white coat ceremony, workshop was held on ethics and professionalism for third year BBS students. This continues. Dr. Asha 
Anger is also continuing this program. It's gone on for four years for undergraduates and one year for postgraduates. Dr. Valinda also has participated in two of these uh, programs. Now, the post workshop feedback is extremely encouraging. Please allow me, allow me to share uh, this. The, the results of this. Uh, what was done was those who attended 2016 programs were interviewed in 2019, that is after three years. And uh, the qualitative analysis done, the students reported that the sessions were eye openers and helped them to understand that patients need to be treated as humanely and not merely as cases. They also understood the need to practice the ethical principles and professionalism and attributes with and communication with patients, peers, and faculty. The students learning over three years showed a statistically significant improvement in the post test knowledge scores. And then the behavioral change was observed in 92% of the students. They reported being compassionate and considerate towards patient. And some 70% some gave anecdotal evidence of how their behavior is has changed. So this is, so there is some ray of, ray of hope. Why I am present, I have presented this is not to boast ourselves, but to suggest to you that every med dental college, in fact, every health professional colleges could take up this and uh, uh, give a students an idea of what is ethics, what is professionalism, and surely uh, when we train them at their younger days, they will certainly be able to follow that better. And the many of the uh, observations made by Dr. Linda may perhaps uh, decrease and there might be improvement in our own behavior. So in conclusion, I have a wish. And that wish is the ethics should be internalized by us. Internalization is perhaps the highest change in our behavior. If I may say so, that every RBC in us has a hemoglobin component. And then and every RBC component should have an ethical component in our blood. That is internalization I'm hoping for. And I wish one day it happens before I leave this. Um, how should it be done? And Gandhiji suggested this. And then we had such great leaders, Vivekananda. Vivekananda said, look here, a harmonious development of head, hand and heart is the mark of a model man. And there is head, we have plenty of head. We have good hands, but I think the heart needs to be improved upon. We have perhaps a weak heart, it needs to be pumped up. This is my wish, this is my dream, this is my hope. With this, may I conclude and say thank you. And let us be, be Ramachandra. Because tell me, which other teacher has been remembered like this? Where a centenary is being, his centenary is being celebrated by his students who themselves have achieved a lot. Dr. Nagesh, Dwarka Nath, Faizuddin, and several others, many international uh, teachers who had come for this, the Platinum Jubilee celebrations and so on. When they are thinking, surely, that, that Ramachandra is a role model for us and we should change our own behaviors, behaviors, become more ethical, more friendly, and more concerned with the patients. Thank you very much the, for giving me this opportunity and to share my thoughts and experience. If there are any questions, I shall be able to answer at the end. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hello? 
Hello. Yes, Hello? yes. One second, there is some yes problem yeah. here. Yes, yes. Can I speak? Yes. Please yeah. go ahead. Uh, I am highly thankful to Professor Olinda and Professor D K Shinwas for their very enlightened talk. Dr. D K Shinwas, you have really shown us the path. For all the teachers of all the faculties, with your very methodical way of preparing the curriculum, or with regard to the ethics, and uh, you are always identified with uh, three things in the curriculum, which is uh, very much quoted everywhere. You have said must to know essential to know and desirable to know which has become very part of uh, all the curriculum developed by the university we are really fortunate to have you as a consultant you have established the road you have shown the road sign and uh, to some extent uh, i think our generation of teachers have followed it and it is now for the future generation of teachers to follow the signpost shown by you. A big pranam to you and to Dr. Valinda Timms, who is coming out with a book on ethics in dentistry very soon by the Rajiv Gandhi University. And I'm sure that Dr. D. K. Shinwa's talk and the Valinda's talk will influence a lot of youngsters to take this forward in an arena where the medical practice has become an investigation-based medicine and a commercial medicine. Let us move that from that arena to more of a very sympathetic, empathetic, and heartwarming profession back to our old times of service orientation. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Dr. Nagesh. You have been noble as ever. And you are one of the role models that uh, everyone should uh, take note of and follow. Now, may I, uh, with uh, Dr. Manjunath, may I introduce the next speaker and go ahead? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, uh, I have a great pleasure. In fact, our panel was uh, an another unique one. Because we had two Rajas and a Rani. The Rani was Dr. Valinda and the two Rajas we have. Now I'll introduce one of the Rajas and that is um, Rajkumar. Rajkumar Ale. Rajkumar Ale is a brilliant academician. Uh, he has uh, always stood first in his uh, during his undergraduate and postgraduate studies. He has uh, a number of degrees, postgraduate degrees. He has uh, not only uh, MDS, but also he has got uh, membership of the Royal College of uh, Surgeons for, and also fellowship also. And then, uh, then he is, uh, was the member of the Dental Council Karnataka Dental Council, and then uh, he was uh, past president of the Karnataka State Dental Council. He was a Senate member of the Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences. He was executive member of the Dental Council and of also of the uh, Indian D Dental Association. And he has uh, many achievements. He is a member of the World Federation of Orthodontics. He is a PhD guide. He is editor in chief for the Idea Journal and also for the Karnataka a Dental Council Journal. He is a NABH SSE. He has uh, 35 uh, publications and he has three research projects on hand. And more importantly, he has uh, four patents under registration. So here is 
Rajkumar, sir, your name itself suggests, sir, you are indeed a king of orthodontics. Uh, on to you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I am uh, uh, really humbled and honored. First of all, um, uh, I feel myself to be bl myself blessed that I am talking uh, in the, on this uh, special occasion of centenary celebration of Dr. S. Ramachandra. I am indeed always proud that I am double alumni of uh, Government Dental College, Bangalore. Uh, every time I pass across Government Dental College, uh, I, I, I have a big salute for this uh, institution and whatever we are today, it is only because of uh, the Government Dental College. And a special thanks to our teachers, uh, Dr. Nagesh, Dr. Hiramar, and the entire uh, team which is working uh, for this centenary Another moment is Dr. S. Ramchandra was the first uh, president of Karnataka State Dental Council. That, that gives a double joy for me. And uh, of course, Dr. D.K. Srinivasan, uh, you always been a role model. Uh, we have followed your path. Uh, we have heard you n number of times. And then you have always been inspirational as always. Well, on this occasion, I hope you are not bored. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hope you are not bored. <laughs> so, uh, please carry on. Uh, yeah, I have been best on mute. Please carry on. Uh, uh, task of um, uh, speaking on a uh, state dental council role uh, in the implementation of code of ethics. Well, uh, the dental council of India is the body uh, which, uh, you know, rather implements or prescribes uh, the code of ethics. Uh, there was uh, after the 1948 Dentist Act in the year 1970, um, uh, the code of ethics were amended and off late in the year 2014, a special panel was constituted by the Dental Council of India, uh, which prescribed a quite an elaborative and informative code of ethics. Now, <clears throat> it's, it's mandatory that every dental surgeon who registers with the State Dental Council has to sign an undertaking that they will abide their practice of, you know, following this code of ethics. I'll just quickly... Uh, probably um, running through all the ethical guidelines would be an elaborate and exhaustive talk. I'll just run through the gist of that and then probably a, a few um, an information on role of um, State Dental Council uh, in terms of uh, implementing ethical guidelines. Sir, is my <laughs> slide visible? Because I cannot, uh, when I, once I open the slide share, I cannot see the Igacia yes. window. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, I, I was the past president of State Dental Council some time back, just, um, you know, um, I, I'm a designer, I don't know, I'm get taken over. And the Code of Ethics has got um, um, seven chapters. I cannot, um, I, I might have to probably display word to word so you can see my slide little crampled, but uh, I'll just, just quickly brief through all uh, these chapters. The Code of Ethics chapter one talks about uh, the duties of the dentist. The first thing is um, that the, every dentist who registers has to give an undertaking that um, he's going to dentistry uh, abiding by uh, <laughs> codes of ethics. Now the chapter 3.1 talks about character of dentist here there are now we need to practice <coughs> i'll quickly brush through this so i will go point by point because all of us are aware of this um, uh, you know legal guidelines only those salient or highlight points probably i'll slightly brush upon so we have to uh, pro probably exhibit high um, level of character morality and courteous to, and sympathetic to our patients and maintain practice our practice should be based on um, you know the core the, the core value of our practice has to be based on the service to humanity with the devotions or the scientific knowledge and skills have to be delivered based on or, uh, or with, the, with the background of ethics we need to deliver our dentistry that's what that point talks about now every dental surgeon 
uh, should maintain a professional association with the fellow colleagues in terms of IDA or the speciality association. And then but we should make a continuing dental education as a part of a regular updating of the clinical skills and knowledge. These are all part of the ethical guidelines. Now, maintenance of good dental records. Yes, from the point of um, um, as a legislation or as a rule, we need to maintain at least minimum of um, three years every clinical records. And whenever there is a clinical record um, requested by any authority, it is our obligation that within 72 hours, we should give them the clinical records. Now, whenever dentists can register or assign some medical certificates, whichever treatment they have done, and <clears throat> now keeping up with the time, it's, it's ethical to digitalize dental and medical records. Now, display of registration number as an ethical guideline, we need to display a registration number in our prescription pads and certificates and whatever the uh, handouts we get so that the dentist who is uh, signing these, uh, he, he's, a, he's a valid dentist. That's the idea of uh, uh, you know having a registration number displayed on a certificate. Uh, whenever we add um, uh, suffixes, that means the degrees, the abbreviations, uh, our names, those degrees which are only conferred or which are in the schedule of our dental council or dentist act, only those degrees to be added or those degrees which are conferred universities and such associations which are registered and they are conferred in a special convocation only those suffixes can be added to your name and adding other um, suffixes or degrees is unethical i probably highlight a little bit on this aspect prescribing drugs and only those drugs i mean i'm just quickly running through this because i'm sure all of us are uh, you know aware of our ethical guidelines and when I, I'll just highlight on the uh, role of state dental council in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, implementing these. Now, chapter two talks about uh, duties of dental practitioner to their patient, the level of uh, uh, the character and morality, uh, what we have heard so far, which has to be exhibited by every dentist uh, in terms of when they're um, you know, handling their patients. There has to be a, a, you know, uh, an empathy and a care. The quality care has to be of the highest standard. That's the idea of um, obligation or rather it is an obligation to his patients. All right. Now, there is every a dentist can refuse treatment, but it should not be based on the discrimination. Discrimination in terms of color, caste, religion or nationality. That's it's our obligation to treat every patient and we should not. Uh, rather uh, refuse the treatment based on these things. Now, confidentiality, we have to be, I mean, whatever they um, come across or we have from the patients uh, during the contact of our patients with the, during the treatment that should be uh, rather confidentiality has to be maintained. Now, prognosis, we have to be factual. Now, this is the point which is probably leading to a lot of conflicts. <coughs> probably highlight few things as my experience uh, as a president when we're hearing the matters when we're uh, hearing the patient complaints what are the points which are leading to these conflicts and when i come to that it is it's normally the over exaggerated prognosis we have to be factual when we're talking about prognosis of the treatment so now dental surgeons and uh, specialists now this is a speciality practice the practice is no more the way it was treated i mean rather rendered earlier it was a standalone clinics many a time earlier days <laughs> now there are multi speciality centers which have started with all the uh, consultants and speciality practices happening so this particular chapter talks about the obligation of consultants with the dentist role and the way they have to rather in tandem the way they have to work each one has to respect the opinion of the other person and they have to be factual and the patient interest has to be the prime concern of these two people. That's the idea of having a, 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 a rather a speciality practice. Now, when it comes to disclosure, opinions, uh, am I clear? Am I audible? Dr. Yes, Kuranur, am I clear? Okay. You're audible. You're clear. Of course. There's a background, there's a background noise. That's the reason. Yes. So, uh, 
this is about the um, obligation of the specialist and the uh, you know the, the the consultant dentist now fees and other charges it is always the cost of the treatments have to be displayed in every practice and then every dental surgeon should exhibit their complete name designation along with all the degrees what is required and he has registered in his practice as well as in all the prescriptions now chapter 4 talks about responsibilities of dentists to each other now this is this is the place where there is a lot of unethical issues uh, crop up now because of the number of dentists into the practice there are some 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 situations are such that the conflicts are ari arising because of contravening opinions given by one dentist on the other dentist so this particular chapter talks about the kind of integrity every dentist has to exhibit when he is uh, rather uh, interacting in terms of patient tre treating a patient of other dentist as well as when they are in communication with each other now <clears throat> now we to have um, commitment it, it is ethical to have maintain a, a good relationship with our paramedical staff their interests because they are working with us their interests their health are also of the concern uh, should be a concern to the dentist uh, as well as the community dentistry in terms of public at large it is an it's an ethical obligation of every dentist uh, to induce or rather um, educate the community about the oral health and the uh, prevailing diseases of that particular area now <clears throat> this is a chapter which probably i would like to highlight what constitutes to be an unethical now what are the things which amount to unethical in terms of uh, you know uh, from the point of um, a state dental council we talk about advertisement now today everything works on advertisement if you see every product is sold when it is introduced it is put into the community and it is advertised its success depends on advertisement so what is happening this market driven force is got into uh, this medical profession too. you see every corporate hospital is engaging advertising agencies uh, to rather probably to achieve their success or their targets so that is probably has gone into dentistry today <laughs> now what is um, uh, advertisement now those things those actions of the dentist which are meant to solicit the patient to make the patient <clears throat> to visit to their uh, dental clinic amounts to advertisement so it is unethical to advertise any form now what is soliciting inducing false promises these clinics advertising in the form of free offers giving um, special rebates all these amount to unethical acts now whether the advertisement is directly or indirectly many a time the articles written in the uh, newspapers or in the public media any uh, place whether it is electronic or print media when we are placing an um, article any doctor it is purely based on the scientific and it is meant for educating the public it is an i mean it is not unethical or it is not unethical it is it is ethical but when it is meant for advertising his particular office or a particular clinic it becomes unethical that's the uh, code in this particular section now any misleading advertisement or press reports promise of incontinuity rebates and false benefits become unethical now there are situations to hire agents and canvassers now you see with uh, so much happening uh, our uh, medical tourism there are agents hired by some of the clinics uh, to get the or to cater the patients to their particular offices so any um, uh, action of indulging in these kind of uh, or uh, an action or an engagement is unethical also having a disproportionately large signs and then uh, you know glow sign boards all these uh, are defined as unethical acts and uh, as i said the commercial articles writing commercial articles with the uh, offering or special highlighting or glorifying their treatment 
statements amounts to unethical now this is a point which which normally gets into conflict now there was a a case which was registered in the medical council of tamil nadu now the um, advertising in yellow pages whether it is ethical or unethical now the case went on hearing and then finally the court said the doctor can advertise his name address of the clinic and phone number that can that is permitted but glorifying it larger display bigger numbers and and colorful or rather you know uh, compared to the other names if you are highlighting your particular matter then it becomes unethical this is a point which again uh, you know came in for a quite an amount of discussion in our karnataka state dental council too so i thought it's worth um, explaining that now um now what is permitted when you can uh, uh or rather convey your information to the community now whenever you open a practice you can bring it to the knowledge of the community you are living in now how you can bring it a truthful display of starting of your practice your advertisement your phone numbers paper but it should be limited to the community you are living in or any change of type of practice any addition or change of address or temporary absence of doctor i am not going to be there in the practice you can probably it. so these are certain things which are permitted under the ambit of our ethical guidelines but sometime in the disguise of these some of the unethical acts happen which will probably uh, highlight when the one it uh, <coughs> or uh, what are the different scenarios what come through now <coughs> the signages it is unethical to put your own photograph put the banners or any uh, you know handouts or posters in the uh, neighboring chemists or any other um, practices you normally have other practices <laughs> Uh, any medical practices or hospitals wherein uh, people you know exhibit their clinic addresses and you know highlighting uh, uh, doctors photograph and highlighting things that is unethical so these are certain things what constitutes uh, in terms of um, unethical acts now in terms of uh, you cannot offer a rebate or a commission is become unethical and whenever you have suppose a dentist is indulge in a um, uh, clinical research as explained by dr thames and uh, dr dk shrinivas sir or any institution or individual dentist is involved with the clinical research he has to maintain a high level of um, he has to abide by the icmr guidelines his research project has to be registered and so on so the, unless it is a um, a monitored research conducting a self style clinical research or a trial in a dental clinic is unethical having the abbreviations of these which are irrelevant you know some of the time people write bds mida bds rdp or you know these kind of things you know adding these suffixes of membership of uh, certain bodies is unethical it is misleading to the um, public general public so these are quite a common complaints we get that you know my so and so fellow colleague practicing in my neighborhood has got this kind of uh, degrees added to his uh, this thing whether it is ethical or unethical so we might have to i mean we keep writing clarification on these things that is unethical to add these kind of um, suffixes to your name now as well as uh, when to call a dental in a dental hospital this is another uh, point which commonly comes for discussion if you have an inpatient facility plus your clinic is registered under the establishment act as a hospital then you can call your clinic as a dental hospital otherwise you cannot call a dental clinic dental hospital it is quite um, uh, you know this this point gets uh, quite highlighted in andhra pradesh where there is a uh, government scheme the danta suraksha scheme is there so everybody there writes dental hospital whenever they have mudas they call it dental hospital but that is not the true sense of i mean that is not as per the ethics to call dental hospital only if you are registered as a hospital you have inpatient facility then you can call yourself a dental hospital well 
these are certain things we need to maintain our personal integrity when we're treating our patients so there should not be any misconduct personal sexual misconduct between doctors and patients a high level of uh, uh, integrity and that is something to be mentioned for all the gist of our um, uh, ethical guidelines now i'll just quickly run through what is the role of um, now this is a disciplinary chapter 7 talks about in case of unethical act how to voice a complaint and how to order the punishment um, which are uh, under the provision of uh, these ethical guidelines explains in the chapter 7 here the state dental council is the authority i'll talk about this when i'm talking about um the uh, role of our now what are the most common causes of conflicts with my experience of uh, being the president of state dental council for last 5 years the first year of my presidency we were getting about monthly one or two complaints of patients on dentists now in the last 3 years we were getting more than 5 to 10 complaints every month it was such a huge task to hear this matter in our councils now why this was happening now if we look at uh, uh, the kind of complaints were complaints what we were getting there was a clear every time we used to hear the when we uh, rather uh, pin down to the problem the issue why this confl- uh, the conflict has arise it was a clear lack of communication so it's important that every curriculum every dental school takes it as a part of the curriculum that communication skills are taught to our students as it was highlighted earlier lectures our students should be taught about the communication soft skills and ethical guide now another point why the conflict was arising quite often was over promising on the success of treatment now uh, these dental treatments are multifactorial etiologic now sometime it is beyond the control of the dentist uh, to rather predict the 100% success of that particular treatment but what happens is in the in the gist of uh, uh, rather uh, getting the patient or of uh, starting the treatment of the patient many dentists indulge in um, rather promising the patient that you know at the end of his treatment there will be 100% success so this is landing uh, many a time when they come across failures it is leading to conflicts so it's important that if the, when the dental surgeon is advocating the treatments he should rather probably give a choice give him the um, the success rate of that particular uh, treatment he let him be aware that what are the consequences which lead to the failure then only it is uh, you know it, it can be um, the patient will be ready to accept the failures but you know many a time it doesn't happen that way then you know, end up in a conflict so the next thing is over marketing so every time a patient walks into a dental clinic many a time the dentist over market their treatments when i say over marketing means a lot of um, the glorified things are given you know the, if you get uh, for example a treatment you're going to become perfect your smile is going to look so the patient will have an imaginary sense of himself that at the end of the treatment i am going to be like this or say for example now the patient is got in a terrible pain of his last molar the wisdom tooth is gone into a uh, pericoronitis and is got a pain in the in the zeal to treat him immediately the patient i mean patient is told that at the end of treatment as soon as we do the intervention you could be all right but there is going to be any no problem but he fails to explain them that what are the consequences what are the unseen consequences which can arise and they are leading up in conflict now the lack of documentation this is something that every dental school should make it mandatory now in my dental college uh, we made in an exhaustive documentation protocol and then we've been following it now document when i say documentation the patient's consents the complete factual appraisal of the patient condition has to be documented what happens is if there is no documentation then the conflict becomes uh, you know patient centric what says becomes um, you know rather 
uh, a serious thing other than what uh, the opinion is expressed by the doctor. If there is a documentation, signed document, it, it solves a lot of issues. At the beginning of the treatment, even the patient has got a lot of confidence on the doctor. The doctor is zealous. In, the, in, the, in this hurry of starting the treatment, people fail to document. When that happens, that that when there is when the when the things don't happen as planned, when they when they end up in a roadblock, then the conflict. These are documentation is something which probably should be made mandatory and it should be taught as a curriculum to all our graduates. Now loss of trust. <coughs> what happens is whenever uh, we were seeing the cases, the patients would have or rather um, they would have heard or a more about that particular dentist capabilities and then when they come back and then when the when when they have their experience if there is um, a difference in the opinion what they had about him and when they uh, meet him in person if there is a difference if there is a dichotomy in their opinions or the charges then the trust is lost and the conflict start from that point so it's important that the trust is maintained all through the treatment now the last one is unethical practice by a fellow dentist when i say this a lot of times at least 50 percent of the time the conflicts reach state dental council or any other forum it's because a fellow dentist makes a derogatory comment on the treatment or on the charges or on the the way the dentistry or the uh, or the delivery of dentistry has happened so that ends up in the conflict so common things are now if they look at a radiograph and if they see there is a, a instrument separated and if it is even well within the canal it's quite you know it's quite normal it can happen to anybody but if the dentist says that hey your previous doctor has left an instrument in his in your tooth it's a disaster for the patient so it's important the way the things or the way the previous um, dentist treatment is explained uh, that depends on uh, you know the, the ethical values or the kind of uh, probably um, what the character of the next dentist so these are certain things what lead to conflicts now role of state dental council state dental council is authority which is empowered to implement the dentistry is practiced as per the ethical guidelines so that's why as i said we undertake of undertaking um, is signed by every dentist when they come for registration. Now, whenever we see uh, some dentist is not practicing as per the code of ethics or there is a um, violation of code of ethics, the state dental council can initiate disciplinary action either suo moto or based on the complaint of another dentist. State dental council is the authority which, can, which has got the powers to suspend the registration if found guilty after hearing the matter of course there is a protocol uh, uh, the, the uh, both the parties are given hearing then uh, uh, if required an expert committee is formed and then uh, factual appraisal is taken care and in the best interest of both the patient as well as the dentist the decisions are taken now <clears throat> any complaint of professional misconduct or grievance registered with police or any such matter or any such forum that has to be referred to the state dental council. This is um, rather a cover or a protection what Dentist Act 1948 gives to dentists. That means any patient who is aggrieved by a dentist cannot simply go and register in any, any police station nor the police can register a criminal case against the dentist unless the state dental council hears the matter and gives its opinion and then if, if the grievance or rather if the case um, is a criminal neglect then uh, then the police takes over and the criminal case is filed so uh, every time we see the police referring the matters whenever um, they they get a complaint many times so, go to the police and register a complaint they send the matter to the state dental council and it is the state dental council uh, which which has to hear this particular matter 
it's always you know as, as a, when we were in the council we would always uh, rather it will be wrong on my part to say uh, partial to the dentist but we would take uh, a little kind of concerned about the professional if he is not involved uh, in a criminal way or any other uh, way i mean his intention if uh, his intentions were not to uh, hurt or to cheat the patient then you know it, it is always i mean i'm, I'm not talking uh, uh, the, this thing but um, the state town council always looks um, that particular issue from that angle and then the justices are uh, rolled out now um, I'm, I'm on time yes so before i conclude it's uh, indeed an honor uh, to speak uh, on um, the teacher of teachers dr s ramchandra's uh, centenary celebration and this is the place we have learned dentistry and always indebted to it also so thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity then i would be happy to take up uh, this is an elaborate topic uh, i could I, i have to rush through certain things so if there are any questions i would be happy to uh, pick up uh, thank you very much dr rajkumar i think you will have plenty of questions uh, now the next speaker is uh, another another raj uh, those of you who have read or heard or uh, seen on tv ramayana will easily remember this a uh, famous uh, uh, king and uh, i'm sure you will guess this he is sita's father the, the king janak the janak raj and he was a darshi but i am introducing another janak raj who is a whom i call dantarshi a dentarshi because his um, cv took me in 45 minutes to go through and he has so many achievements to his credit uh, his uh, presentation is recorded because he is uh, he was not available today and i will uh, in view of the time constraint i will be very brief in introducing him i hope he will not uh, mind or he will not take uh, <clears throat> that i am showing disrespect not at all very humbly i am saying i have called him dantarshi or a dentarshi and he is uh, at the moment uh, he is of course an mna of the gdc both bds and mds he is a oral maxillofacial surgeon of repute he is at the moment principal of indraprastha dental college at ghaziabad he was uh, earlier director professor and hod in a number of government hospitals in delhi uh, he was also chairman of the division of dentistry of bureau of uh, standards india he was past president of the uh, ida indian dental association and also delhi dental association he has been a member of several committees and councils a member of dental council uh, from 2006 till january of 2020 he is, a, he is on the ugc expert committee he is in about five committees of the ministry of health in order to improve uh, dental sciences central task force and several other committees he has a number of fellowships international about five <coughs> four from us and one from uk of course he has uh, several national fellowships he has awards like life achievement award by the ida and then uh, by the association of oral and maxillofacial surgeons and uh, several other uh, achievements i will uh, with with simply with great humility i'll cut short this and hope janak raj will not uh, mind about this is purely because of the constraint of time now uh, dr manjunath would you take over now please for presentation which is recorded a yes, presentation sir. yes sir share the screen we we on behalf of the organizers i apologize for that we have 
exceeded time. Uh, I didn't want to cut anybody, including my own, because this is such a unique opportunity. And uh, we will never, I have never come across where a teacher is being celebrated like this. Therefore, I, um, I did not restrict anyone, including myself, about the talk. So, Manjunath, please take over. Those of you who are hungry can have a meal because we will not be able to see you or you can carry on your meal uh, as you hear this. And this is a great advantage, unlike any classroom. Manjunath, please. Sir, are you seeing this? Yes. Audio is not. Dr. Manjunath, audio is not functioning. One minute, sir. You have to unmute. There's no audio. Dr. Manjana.
హలో 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 దర్ ఇస్ నో ఆడియో హలో Dr. Manjunath, are you speaking? Yeah, hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello, I can hear you. The speaker cannot be heard at all. So... No, no, I... Yeah, yeah, we are just dissolving it for a while. Okay. Should we take some questions, Dr. Srinivas, in the meanwhile? Madam, are you able to hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, one minute. In that case, we, one minute. We will try once again by sharing the screen. Okay. You can hear me now? No, sir. No. Audio is visible. We can hear you, but speaker, not the but, speaker. Uh, we can hear he is visible. Dr. Janakaraj is visible, but we can't hear. There is no uh, audio at all, huh? No, no audio at hear. all. No, absolutely no. Okay. Uh, Dr. Srinivas, maybe we can go with the Q&A, if anything. And then when they are ready with the audio, then we can... Yeah, I think so. Um, Dr. Manjunath. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Dr. Manjunath will go through question and answer. Yeah. And uh, you can, uh, you know, resolve. Yeah, we'll if in case it's not resolved, anyway, it is recorded. You can always pass it on now, recorded to all of us. Yes. Uh, now, are the questions with you, Dr. Manjunath? I have a WhatsApp to you. Okay. Uh, Well, only one question has come to me. Two questions have given, sir. How, how many? Two questions. Um, I have yeah, two questions. One is uh, bringing change in mind that requires cultural change, culture change, collective action beyond colleges. How do we achieve it? Belinda, would you like to go? Okay. 
Um, yes, I understand so this, this because actually I've already yeah. mentioned that. But anyway, no, no. I, I, read, I, read the, I mean, I, I read it yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, this is a, a common uh, issue yeah. that we are uh, always dealing with in teaching ethics because we are teaching it in the context of our society. And and uh, what happens is it is the collective ethics of society which actually impacts our students and the way they are formed, the, what, what they observe before they come into dental college or medical college, how they, how they perceive themselves and their duties towards society even before they enter the health profession so yes there is a big impact that is made by society and the way that we our children are formed within society if we are if we train them to be competitive if we train them to look after themselves and not worry about anyone else <laughs> if we have that kind of a uh, uh, yes. you know, school curriculum uh, early college curriculum then when they come to the, the yeah. health yes when they come to yeah. uh, the health and medical colleges a dental college they bring with them that sort of competitiveness that sort of self-seeking and uh, attitudes where it is each man for himself uh, our our society definitely impacts the way that our, uh, our ethics training will be rolled out in the colleges so we have to actually um, address that even in the first year we can talk about uh, you know what is happening in society is one thing but what uh, what are the responsibilities or what are the duties of a doctor or a dentist that has to be discussed and negotiated uh, it is going to be difficult only because students are a part of society and we cannot deny that and our society has transitioned to this point where unethical practices in all areas whether it is other professions and it is polit political system is there it exists it is current suddenly we talk about morals and ethics and duties and we are seem to be out of step, but we have to push the envelope on this. We have to um, bring this discussion and get it from the students. And I have seen that first year students, when they are asked to talk about what would be an ideal doctor, who is a good doctor, they come out with the aspirations. They come out with the ideas and thoughts on this, which are very much in line with principles of ethics. So, so it is not that it is there, it's missing altogether, but we have to call upon it, I feel. And not get to put off by the fact that society is unethical. Yeah, thank, thank you uh, for the answer. This question was asked by Dr. Balchandra Adkuli, who is a health person educationist. Uh, well, I also did this uh, study in a way that I used to ask the first year students what would their aspirations, what would they become. And this, the very student who had, had these qualities of empathy and all those things, by the time he took up internship, there was a sea change uh, in the attitude of those uh, students. It is also because of the environment, the ethos of the, uh, the, the health professional colleges we are working with. That's where I said there is a deficiency or lack of role modeling. And um, so, that is another reason because, yes, collective action, the competitiveness, etc., has. And uh, I think we need more and more role models. I'll ask, I'll go to another question. I think, uh, Dr. Raj, uh, you have to take this, Rajkumar. Are the developments in patients' rights affecting the rights of physician and healthcare professionals? Am I clear? Shall I read again? Are the developments in patients' rights? affecting the rights of physicians and healthcare professionals because you spoke of the rights of the even Olindo also spoke about the rights so now is it affecting the rights of physicians and health professionals dr rajkumar is, is rajkumar anywhere around Not Rajkumar? Uh, because it's a question of on the council, isn't it? Is it affecting the rights of physicians and healthcare professionals? The patient's rights versus the rights of the go ahead for this again. Uh, 
Hello. Rajkumar is probably as a busy man. Is yeah. Yes, Valinda, would you like to <laughs> take this also? Anyone else can also please just jump <laughs> in because I'm I'm fine with that. Yeah. I mean, anyone I'm else can. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah yes. I, anyone I, in the audience? Yeah. yeah. Say, I would love. Wonderful, actually, I would wonderful love question. Question. Yes. I would love to hear from anyone, uh, dental yeah. professionals. Anyone else? And also uh, others, but let me let me just yeah, try okay. here because you see. Um, there are definitely rights of doctors as well. We talk about rights of patients, and we understand that in, in the in the context of human rights and uh, uh, and health rights and so on. But we also have uh, there are certain rights of doctors as well. The right to uh, work according to one's conscience is an important right. It has been enshrined in even uh, international declarations, and we are we cannot be forced to do something that is against our conscience. That is a right. Um, and then uh, the duties are much more than uh, rights. I think if you list things, I think there are more yeah. duties than rights. Um, but uh, having said that, I think the the the, due, the rights to to also to advocate to uh, against practices like torture and uh, and all of that, to refuse to uh, participate yes. in torture, to refuse to participate on something that is morally wrong, and that is why I said that in the beginning that. Um, medical care is a moral enterprise. It is not just uh, in, like any other, uh, uh, say, for example, building a bridge or putting up a, uh, a, a building or, or something like it is dealing with human beings who are vulnerable and the human beings in need. Uh, it is also dealing very closely with their existence and their welfare. And so it is a moral uh, enterprise because it calls on trust. It calls on uh, harm. I mean, the the capacity to prevent harm or do harm and all of those and justice it speaks of justice issues so because of all that it is uh, considered a moral enterprise and as soon as as early as we can sensitize our students about this uh, they i'm i'm quite sure that they will uh, take it upon themselves to uh, live up to that expectation yeah, they just need to be sensitized more than that so dr rajkumar has joined yeah good Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranga. Uh, Rajkumar, any other question? There was one more question that is about the cost of uh, dental treatment. Would any, uh, any from the dentist profession like to say, they say the cost of uh, dental treatment is very high. Is there any way of means or way of uh, bringing it uh, down so that it is affordable? Anyone would like to, from the faculty of dentistry, would like to take this? Sir, I'm, uh, can you just come again, sir? There's a little network issue here. So, I yeah, missed yeah. the question. I, uh, I think what I, I, Manjunath, Manjunath, what I suggest is, yes, sir. Um, it, it's, it's, it's already now, uh, uh, nearly 15 minutes past one. So, it, since uh, since Rajkumar uh, Sabarwal's uh, presentation is recorded, sir, I think Shriyansh is ready. Yes, sir. Shriyansh is ready. Yeah. Shriyansh? Yes, I'll start the. Oh, video. I see. Okay. Yes, sir. If it is ready, presentation. Fine. Yes. Otherwise, uh, he's ready, sir. Okay. Yeah, how long it takes? Well, let me express. Seven minutes. Thanks. And hard yeah. to the organizers. Yeah. Yes. Sir for giving me this opportunity to act as speaker in this series of webinars. I also congratulate and compliment the GDC RI Alumni Association for taking great initiative of celebrating the birth centenary of Dr. S. Ramachandra, the first principal of GDC RI. As you know, ethics are the moral principles or virtues that govern the character and conduct of an individual. Dental ethics means moral duties and obligations of the dentist towards his patients, professional colleagues, to, and to the society as a whole. It virtually affects every decision made by dentists, encompassing activities of both judging and choosing. Dentists are challenged to practice within an increasingly complex cultural and ethnically diverse community. 
they have to behave with honor and decency and act with the highest standard of integrity, professional conduct and objectivity and communicate in an honest and responsible manner. They have to actively support and promote the profession and its service to the public. A dentist's primary responsibility is service to the patient and to use his knowledge, skills and experience to improve the oral health of the public. Dentists are expected to follow the highest ethical standards with the primary goal as the benefit of the patients. In any profession, when there is a persistent failures by individuals to adhere to ethical standards, a code of ethics is developed to guide the responsible behavior of its members. The code of ethics defines the values and principles that shape the decision made by the professional and marks the moral boundaries within which professional services are ethically provided. In dentistry, like in any other profession, a set of principles contributes in establishing the code of ethics. It broadly constitutes the fundamental principle of beneficiary, non-malfinance, informed consent, respect for integrity and patient autonomy. In India, dentistry is regulated by a, a statutory body known as the Dental Council of India, which was set up by an Act of Parliament, the Dentist Act 1948. The Dentist Code of Ethics was first laid down by DCI in 1976. This was superseded in 2014 and the revised code was notified by the DCI card as Revised Dentist Code of Ethics Regulation 2014. These regulations continue to be in the force. These regulations prescribe the duties and obligations of dentists, dental surgeons and specialists of the patient and public and to the dental professional and paramedical professionals. Unethical acts have also been broadly laid down in these regulations. In terms of these regulations, dentists' paramount concern should be health and comfort and welfare of the patients. His behavior towards patient and the public should be friendly, helpful and dignified. Some of the more important points relate to maintaining confidentiality of the patient, not neglecting patients to represent professional qualifications accurately without any overstatement of fact or implying credentials that do not exist, not to pay or receive any commission, gift or hospitality, maintenance of proper dental and medical records, display of registration number, not to sign any untrue certificate, etc. A dental surgeon primary responsibility is service to the patient and to use his knowledge, skill and experience to improve the oral health of the public. As dentistry continues in, to advance, it is imperative that dental surgeon keep on updating and enhancing their knowledge and skills. For this purpose, they must actively participate in scientific workshops, symposiums, conferences and continuing dental education programs that provide information, strengthen clinical competence and enhance the professional judgment. The regulation also de define unethical acts which mainly relate to issue of the false and misleading advertisements, direct marketing advertisement in the electronic media, publicity and signages, solicitation, endorsement of drugs, immoral acts, including abuse of professional relationships and sexual misconduct with the patient, undertaking research projects fund, funded by pharmaceutical and allied healthcare industries, professional autonomy, etc. Dental surgeons should possess not only knowledge, skill and technical competence, but also traits of the character that foster adherence to ethical principles, quality of honesty, integrity, fairness and charity. It is the burden, duty and responsibility of every dental surgeon to study and strictly abide by these regulations and act in the patient's best interest to provide the highest standards of clinical care. Non-compliance of this code is a letter and spirit can result in sanctions from censure to loss of professional status. Any complaint with regard to professional misconduct is inquired 
into by the concerned state dental council or dental council of india while doing so the dental practitioner is also given an opportunity to be heard in person or by pleader professional incompetence is judged by an ethics committee consisting of qualified persons of integrity and good name from amongst the prominent registered dental surgeons in the state dca has conducting been conducting seminars workshops conferences etc to make the dental professional aware about their duties and responsibilities indian dental association association can also play an important role in implementation of the code of dental ethics ida having a large network of 36 state branches and 700 local branches with a total membership of number more than 75000 members can play a very important role in the implementation of the code ida and its branches as also in other similar association of dental professionals of various specialties can organize an increasing number of continuing dental education programs seminars workshops and conferences on the topic and make its members aware of their duties responsibility and obligations as laid down in the dca regulations dental profession has a special place of trust in the society and therefore dental surgeon must adhere to ethical standards in the dental procedures thank you jai hind <clears throat> thank you very much uh, dr rajkumar for that brief uh, presentation highlighting the role of dental council of india the revised guidelines and then you stressed about the need for continuing uh, dental education and how the dental council of india is also conducting several uh, such programs uh, besides the aspects which had already been mentioned by dr rajkumar ali now are there any questions on this dr manjunath any questions uh, no sir S sir can i ask a question otherwise shall i why I... no please well, i am dr faizuddin who to whom are you i am dr faizuddin faizuddin yes uh, yes uh, dr faizuddin uh, question is directed to curse for the and moderator dakshina murthy dr dk shrinivas sir i have a question can introduction of thank you am i yeah yeah yes, sir yeah yes sir can introduction of spirituality in curriculum will help in yes, inculcating the ethical values uh, yes uh, in fact uh, uh, you might have heard uh, brahma kumaris uh, uh, group they had in, uh, arranged a one day program in mount tabu and for the introduction of spirituality in uh, mbbs course that was about 20 years ago there mm -hmm. i argued that it is uh, not possible because of the overcrowding of the curriculum and there is hardly any time but with passage of time i also changed now i strongly believe that there is need dr willinda has uh, repeatedly mentioned that the call of a doctor is not the need but it the call of the doctor is the heart and uh, therefore there is certainly need uh, dr faizuddin but what happens is um, that we had introduced history of medicine we had introduced uh, several other things but the students orientation at the moment is to pass the examination and mostly by good means and some maybe by any other means and this is uh, probably the present of this one however Uh, realizing this in the book mm -hmm. that was published by rajiv gandhi health university on the what is not at, not taught in medical college medical colleges a chapter has been uh, yes what is not taught in medical colleges uh, but it is applicable to dental also or any other health profession college there is a separate chapter 
written by Dr. Bala Subramanian uh, on the need for teaching spirituality or spiritual medicine in that. I wish uh, each one of us read that chapter and then we need to devise a means, a method, a module where it attracts the present day students. As you know, yeah. the present day students uh, cannot concentrate more than five minutes. Earlier they said 20 minutes. Now it's very difficult to make a student concentrate for five minutes. And they will say, oh, this is not relevant for our uh, passing this, uh, passing the subject. Same thing has happened to ethics teaching also, because it was there in the curriculum, but uh, no one taught or no one asked a question. We had even suggested what questions could be asked. You can ask, ask two questions in the YOC, just two questions. Is informed consent necessary? Or you can give a, give a case study where the student is able to think. And uh, therefore, uh, my conclusion is, Yes, yes, it needs to be, but we need to very carefully craft the module so that it interests the student. And uh, so that is that. Uh, and uh, I'm happy that Dr. Vaisuddin, as spiritual as you are, raised this very important question. I hope I have been able to answer your question to some extent. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. But effective domain of learning as it stands today is being neglected in our curriculum. That is the thing. Yes, uh, true. I, I That's why I quoted so Swami Vivekananda. He said, uh, for the man, there is need for the development of head and the development of hand. Dr. Valinda has stressed that we have the best uh, physicians uh, in the world. We have best surgeons in the world. We have best orthodontists in the world. We have best implant surgeons. Uh, take Grish, uh, for instance. We have all that. But uh, somehow, if you go to a cardiologist, he says, he often tells me, sir, your heart is enlarged. Uh, yes, what he is... What the cardiologists see is the muscle, uh, the muscular physical heart. But what need, yes, what we need is an enlarged conceptual attitudinal heart, let not the physical heart. So we need to become, uh, you know, an enlarged heart. We need to have a heart. Take, for instance, GDC itself. Now, GDC at one point of time had uh, as a director a medical doctor. Now that shows the, you know, the accommodative. Uh, nature of the uh, so like that we should have a large heart and not the cardiologist fellow but a large heart so that we we take into consideration the again uh, going back to Linda the call the call the need for to serve the people so and we need to stress more and more uh, uh, attitudinal and behavioral changes. That's all. The Medical Council of India has introduced recently ATCOM, Attitude Development of Attitude and Communication. I wish all other faculties also develop such ATCOMs, that is, dental and other nursing, physiotherapy, etc. And uh, and I'm sure Dr. Valinda in her the book on dental uh, ethics, bioethics, and dentistry might have added a chapter on uh, related to this attitude. Uh, that's why I also said internalization, what we need is internalization. And for the attitude development, internalization is the you know, highest level of achievement uh, in the, in the right. domain of attitude, that it becomes part of you. It becomes, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, that was a very good question, uh, Dr. Fazuddin. Uh, and I think uh, many people do not want to touch on this very sensitive uh, <laughs> subject. Uh, but, but you know, we are not talking religion here. We are talking spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I think every single person has their own journey of uh, personal journey of spirituality that they are fostering. Uh, it is a way they have been nurtured and grown. And uh, their religion helps them to foster and grow that spirituality within them. Uh, in, in our uh, medical colleges and our dental colleges, mm -hmm. we should allow that spirituality to, uh, to, to continue to blossom. 
uh, in its own way without putting any restrictions uh, and all of that and the important role that has got is uh, in uh, supporting uh, the, the the health professional in his ethical behavior see it is not easy to be ethical it is not easy it is the hard path it is the narrow path it is a difficult path and that is why so many people just decide it is not worth it and so if we want to actually build this resilience in medical students in our faculty yeah. um spirituality actually helps us to attain those higher uh, standards you know and adhere to it and have a different reason and find another reason why uh, we want to be ethical uh, because all around us when things are different it is hard for us and and this is the role of uh, spiritual formation in individuals and the role that it plays uh, in uh, fostering ethical behavior yeah. thank you dr alinda thank you very said, much beautifully said alinda yeah you know the spirituality hello yeah. hello can, can i speak dr ramesh wanted to speak and ask a question dr nagesh dr nagesh go ahead dr nagesh go ahead yeah yeah i think uh, i i'm sure that uh, my colleagues uh, will join me in uh, agreeing that uh, this webinar is our flagship program which has really driven all of us to have a a thought provoking one and how to take our profession um, further on the right lines at least drawing inspiration from wali and the tiger as dr tk jinas put it and uh, we are of course we are training a highly competent uh, professionals who can certainly match with any international standards but along with that we need to also imbibe a common saying ene aago madalu manavanaago vishwa manavanaago i think if we imbibe that into mm. our curriculum yes certainly we will be more uh, competent as well as responsive to the suffering humanity that's what i feel i request dr paisudin if there are any, no other questions to offer his concluding remark once again i thank all the panelists and we are really fortunate to have such enlightened our uh, colleague dr likeshino and dr olinda in the midst of us thank you again on behalf of the country thank you thank you sir before we paisudin is a uh, concluding remarks may i on behalf of uh, uh, dr valinda and be her behalf of the two rajs we had and my own self uh, express our gratitude to the entire team um, dr nagesh faizuddin manjunath and, and sudanshu that is long bharadwaj and others who first of all firstly invited us to participate and secondly who made this webinar a true event which has been a learning for all of us i do hope that the future uh, health professionals including dentists become more humane and behave and consider that uh, not the, only the mouth but the heart also thank you very much dr faizun dr faizun yes you are Yeah, go ahead, Doctor. Yes, sir. Let me tell you, uh, Doctor Linda. I want to share a bit of uh, Faizuddin. Doctor Faizuddin and uh, uh, Doctor Nagesh and uh, Rajeshwari and others. We used to go to uh, Tumkur uh, for academic council meeting, one of the universities there, and uh, we would all go together in a in a van. And uh, return, Faizu Faizuddin would never join us. So I asked Faizuddin. what why are you staying back in tumko for you have a home at you have a house at bank but he says sir i want to go to ramakrishna mission at tumko that is why you did why you didn't go at please wonderful 
Sir, uh, the thing is, I feel that spirituality has got nothing to do with the religion. Spirituality is different, but all religions have got the aspect of spirituality in it. <laughs> That's how it is. That's what I feel. Yes. Yeah. Well, you can become spiritual in several ways. Uh, yes. Uh, um, go Dr. Faisuddin. They are not audible, sir. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Go ahead, please, Dr. Faisuddin. Please go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. That's what I was telling that. I don't consider that spirituality has got nothing, yes. anything to do with religion. But all religions have an aspect of spirituality in it. That's how it is. Sir, may I request you to give the concluding remarks? Yeah, please. Faisuddin, sir. Manjana, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You make all these uh, lectures recorded and uh, put on the YouTube, take steps so that it will benefit those who have not listened. Yes, sir. Today, I think it was on YouTube. Okay. It was live, sir. Okay. Uh, we'll request the organizers to put it on YouTube so that all the previous webinars will be available yeah. to them. Okay. Sir, I am happy to share, sir. Today, 236 participants. Oh. I witnessed the webinar. Very good. Across the world. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Second. Thank you all. Uh, any any final remarks? President, any closing remarks? Or is Manjanath is, is everything over? Yes, sir, I think minute, I think today, today we are done. Yeah. you make the closing remarks. Vote of thanks. Vote of so without it is wasting any time, on behalf of the S. Ramachandra Centenary Year Celebration, I thank wholeheartedly Dr. D.K. Srinivas, the moderator, and Dr. Alinda, Dr. Rajkumar Arle, and uh, Dr. Janakala Sobarwal for their very informative and educative presentation. And I'm sure that this has changed the heart of all the professionals to some extent. At least it has made people to think that we are not just doctors, but we are also human beings and we must be humane. I think we have achieved that goal. That is actually what we had, me, Dr. Nagesh and the committee when we selected this particular topic for the webinar. Once again, I thank you all and thank the whole team of Ramachandra Centenary Celebration for making this program a great success. Thank you very much once again. My special, thank my thank special you. thanks to Dr. Manjinath Puranik because he thank has you so a lot of efforts yes. to coordinate and put the webinars in place. Thank you so much, sir. All your guidance and blessings. Thank you all. Thank you. So with this... Manjunath, uh, you have been excellent. Dr. Manjunath, you have yeah. been excellent. Way you helped us. Yeah, Dr. Sir, Belinda, Belinda, please go on. I just wanted to thank to you here, all, especially the organizers and the commitment to all the practice sessions and to help us to get online in this uh, platform. Uh, thank you all for the speakers. I am really encouraged that other verticals besides uh, medical vertical is taking this uh, whole area of ethics so seriously. And we have great role models among them. So I'm sure we can make a change. Thank you for inviting me and including me in this forum and this webinar. Thanks yeah. very much. One thank you thing. so much. My special thanks to Dr. Reena, yes. an alumni of GDC, for giving us this IGSA platform and be with us in all our webinars. Thank you, Rina. And our team. Yes, Rina, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir and madam. It was a great uh, uh, day we had with you. Thank you so much, sir. All your blessings. Yes. Sir, with this, uh, we'll come to the end of our webinar. Good day. Probably we have uh, more uh, meetings in future. Thank you so much, sir.